starts our service for us this morning. Beautiful. Thank you, Drew. I keep thinking maybe there's another stanza. It's so beautiful. I just sit there and just think more, more, more. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Always a blessing to hear uh, someone play on the piano or the organ the great songs uh, that we know. And good to have you with us today. Everybody's got the smile on their face. Must be the sun came up this morning. Amen. How many of you saw the sunrise this morning? <laughs> at least you're honest. Amen. Boy, it came up. It was just absolutely huge and big and beautiful. At least that's what someone told me. I wasn't up either. And, uh, but it's, it's just, <laughs> it was a beautiful sunrise this morning. And I always think of resurrection when you see that sun come up and uh, that death could not keep his prey. He tore the bars away. Um, just a beautiful sunrise this morning, and glad that God shows us and testifies to us that He is all-powerful. Well, this morning we want to invite you to stand with us and sing this great song, Living Hope. And uh, it's a new song uh, to our church, but it might not be a new song to you. If it is, look at the words as we go through it. And because it's new, uh, oh, you're supposed to sing with us this morning. She's... So you notice that she did this? That's a, <laughs> next time. Okay, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Amen. So if you're not familiar with the song, uh, look at the words, and you will too see how wonderful it is. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven Spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving heart Oh, 
king that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave as no claim on me. Then came the today. <clears throat> we are so blessed and thank you for giving us a living hope. Father, for giving us the opportunity to know you in a personal way, to understand in whatever capacity we have that Jesus died for our sins. He took our place. And because of that, we can be free. Help us, Lord, never to get over that. To never become so familiar with it that it is just cliche. That, Lord, those of us who were dead in trespasses and sin are now made alive in Christ Jesus. Our living hope. God bless this service today. Everything that takes place. Larry, as he preaches later, the choirs, they sing, all of us as we sing these great songs of the faith. May you be in the midst of us today. May we see the smile of your face as we offer the praise of our lips to you and to recall how great our God is. Humbly, Lord, we come before you and you realize that we have nothing good in and of ourselves. That everything we have is from the goodness and the grace given to us by our God. And today we offer it to you as an acknowledgement of your goodness, this sacrifice of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so very much this morning. Wonderful. As the choir begins process of singing this morning, let me just say that uh, the Wilsons have received everything on the list that they needed for um, moving into the home that uh, God's gifted and given them. Uh, they still need some adult lady clothing, but everything else has been gifted and donated. What a blessing. And uh, someone reached out to me this past week, not of our church, but listens to us online and said, I want to be involved in that too. Betty, uh, do you have a total from what we received? Well, last Sunday we received $1,500 plus what the diaconate had given to them, and I've received a couple of contributions. 
So over $2,000 has come in already. So praise the Lord for that. Nice to see people that want to <clears throat> jump on board and help people. And um, if you didn't get a chance to give, I'm sure that Betty will be happy to process that for you. If you want to write a check out, make it to First Baptist Church and then just in the memo, write Wilson's <clears throat> so that you can get credit for that. So good to have you with us, Hillary. You walked in, I got all excited. I couldn't do it real, you know, in public because everybody think I was nuts. Don't want anybody to think I'm nuts, but so good to see you. Amen. Oh, you already know that. I got you. Okay. Amen. Our choir comes. encore <laughs> amen beautiful job choir <clears throat> we're going to dismiss the kids <clears throat> to junior church they can make their way out and you, if you don't mind, grab a hymn and book and turn to 196. 196. <clears throat> Stand with me if you would. <clears throat> there is a fountain. <clears throat> 196. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Yeah. 
their guilty stain and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains and the young thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I go vile as he wash all my sins away wash all my sins away wash all my sins away and there may I go Wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more. Be sin no more till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till this poor lisping stammering tongue my silent in the grave then in a nobler sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save I'll sing thy power to save I'll sing thy power to save then in a nobler sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save amen you may be seated thank you very much Some time back, um, I got this uh, note from Brenda, and she said, Sarah's met somebody, and I think they're going to get married. And I said, text back, and I said, Sarah who? <laughs> and she said, Sarah, you know, Sarah. And I said, Oh, Sarah, why didn't you say Sarah? And um, we were minding our own business one Friday, probably. And we were at a church up in Wapak. Kids were playing flag football or something. And we walked up and Brenda said, He's here. He's here. I said, Who's here? Sarah's boyfriend. I said, Sarah who? We set our lawn chairs out there to watch our kids, and that's the first time I met Larry, to my left, your right, and uh, we had a great chat that day, and you know how you always assess somebody afterwards when you leave, and I said to Brenda, I said, I'm so excited for Sarah, and for Larry too, 
Uh, anytime you take families and try to put them together, uh, many of you know that is not the easiest thing in the world to do. And there are huge mountains and big bumps. Some of them will sh nearly shake you. But God had a purpose and he has a plan. And um, I didn't know. But as Larry and I became more and more familiar and he versed his desire to be in ministry. Um, somehow or another through that we began to talk and the next thing he told me about a situation that he was thinking about doing and we talked and we prayed together and the next thing um, I thought I just got to know him and they're going to be moving to California to go to school and I thought that's just not right and then all of a sudden they start this new program perfect timing they said, well, if you can find a pastor that will mentor you, that meets with our uh, requirements, then we'll let you do online training from where you live. And I was all over that. Amen. I thought, yeah, we can do this. And uh, sure enough, uh, as the Lord would have it, um, I qualified and Larry and I meet uh, regularly as he's going to school um, going to Master Seminary from California. Um, Betty and a few other handful of people know that in the process of going to school, it's like being an electrician. You have to, you know, have to be next to a journeyman. It can teach you, you know, the tools. And then you're standing there and you, you're watching them do it and you think, well, how long do I have to watch them do it? Because I can learn so much better if I do it myself and they can correct me if I make a mistake. And so on Sunday afternoons when you're all eating and home resting, Larry comes back with his family and a few handful of us were sitting here and I get my grade sheet out and he preaches away and I take notes and, and um, we try to figure out if there's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And it's always been a thumbs up. I wish you could just see what I just saw, the smile on Betty's face. Because that's a testimony of the thumbs up. We've been blessed. Ryan, who served his internship here with our youth, filled the pulpit many times. And now we have Larry. And a part of this year's study is for him to be able to preach to an audience like this at least four times. And so uh, today is the first week. And if you get thumbs up, we'll have you back. <laughs> But um, Larry comes to us today, and I'm just tickled to death to share this pulpit with him. It's good to have his mom and dad with us today. Raise your hands so everybody knows who you are. Amen. If you see a lot of amens coming from over here, you can understand why. God bless you as you come and preach the word to us. Thank you very much. Let's say good morning. Andrew, are we on? Okay, um, funny story, I really feel like a celebrity here today because Andrew texted me earlier in the week and he asked me to come, I live in Walpock, so he asked me to come down to Sydney to do a sound test. Well, he had me read from the Bible, and as I was reading, I was like, man, maybe I should have preached that passage. But then my mic started cutting in and out, and I looked over at Drew and I said, what's going on? She goes, well, we're trying to adjust your voice for the acoustics of the room. I said... You can adjust my voice. She goes, well, yes, yeah, what we're doing now. I said, can you make me sound like James Earl Jones? <laughs> or how about Morgan Freeman? Because everybody can listen to Morgan Freeman or James Earl Jones read the dictionary. I am not blessed to have a face for television or a voice for radio. So I greatly appreciate the work that uh, Andrew and Drew did to try to make me sound halfway decent. I also came down with a cough this week, too. So um, I appreciate Pastor John relinquishing his pulpit just like every pastor wants to be in his pulpit, just like every attorney wants to be in court or a doctor in surgery. So Pastor John, he reached out to me last night just asking me how I was doing and if I had a great day, and I proceeded to tell him. I said, well, actually, I'm watching a YouTube video about King James Onlyism. And he started, I could, I, I know, and I know what he was thinking because in my seminary, I typically use the New American Standard uh, 1995 edition, but I was raised King James. And as a Greek student, the uh, New American Standard kind of gives us an unfair advantage in relation to the King James. But 
the King James just holds just a special spot. And I would never want to disrupt the unity here. Pastor John has touched on this before. This is a minor issue for me preaching from the King James. But the unity that Pastor John has discussed, I am more than willing to do that, to preserve the unity that he's spoken of. Very minor. So if you have your Bible, open your Bible with me to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, we'll begin our study this morning at verses 15 through 20. Uh, there's, with a, I think this passage will become helpful to each and every one of you in light of recent events and things that have transpired. Uh, during the last Super Bowl, I didn't watch it, between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles, an estimated 113 million people tuned in to watch the second most watched Super Bowl in NFL history. Following the Super Bowl on February 8th, a quote-unquote revival began on the campus of Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. By the end of this revival, an estimated 50 to 70,000 people had visited the campus in Kentucky. But the question that we need to ask ourselves, the questions we need to ask ourselves, are these sort of events biblical? Is the campaign called He Gets Us that came across in prime time claiming that Jesus understands and that he gets us. Are these biblically sound? Do these align with what Scripture teaches us? Or are these events set out to deceive? How can we tell? How do we know? Now, I could stand up here and give you my opinion, but some time ago, I picked up this quote, and I haven't been on social media for years, so this goes to show you how long ago this has been. I picked up a quote on social media, and the quote said, this was an exchange between a believer and a non-believer. This person said, you can have your opinion, even if it's wrong. Now, the person who wrote that quote is actually here in this room. Now, I'm not going to mention any names, because I don't do that but she's sitting by the man that looks like Sam Elliott and gave birth to me. <laughs> so I'm stealing her quote. Because you have to understand, my mom's very soft-spoken. And when we were on social media, typically when she needed a snarky comment made, she would text me because I, I can do that. I don't, and I'm not on social media anymore, so if you look for me, you're not going to find me. But again, I could give you my opinion, but it doesn't really matter. But to find the answers, we do not need to go any further than the Word of God for clarity and practicing discernment. Now, in Matthew chapter 7, we are close to the end of the Sermon on the Mount that actually began all the way back in Matthew chapter 5. But in the middle of chapter 7, we see our Lord change the tone of His message. In verse 7 of chapter 7, the Lord is dealing with anxieties and He's discussing the goodness of the caring Father. But in verse 13, we get a command to enter the narrow gate. And we find in that pericope that there are few that find the narrow gate. But in verse 15 through 20, Jesus gives us three warnings concerning false prophets. They are, they are the master of disguise. They show their true nature by their disobedience to Christ. And lastly, false prophets and those who follow them will be punished. So let's get into our text today. We'll begin, like I said, begin reading at verse 15. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye 
shall know them. Right at the beginning of verse 15, we, found our, we find our Lord being straight and to the point. The Greek mood here for the verb is that of the imperative mood. Now, the imperative mood in the Greek is the mood of command. He's not, Jesus here is not making a suggestion. He's not saying, hey, you might want to watch out for this. Or, hey, in the future, this may cause a problem. And then the apparent mood in the Greek is a mood of command where Jesus specifically says, beware of false prophets. False prophets always, always find a hearing and are often encouraged by those who are displeased with God's ways. But what is a false prophet? 1 Timothy 4.1, Paul writes concerning false prophets, are spoken as deceitful spirits who advocate doctrines of demons. In 2 Corinthians 11, Paul refers to them as false brothers or false apostles. But just like our Lord states in verse 15, they come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, false prophets, they do not deceive the flock by impersonating the sheep. Oh no, but they impersonate the shepherd. The shepherd is the one who watches over the flock and protects it, just like Pastor John does here with this church. You are his flock. He is the shepherd. Jesus calls himself in John 10.10, the good shepherd. But these false prophets are inwardly ravening wolves, deceitful spirits, false brothers. To us, a wolf is honestly not a big deal. We don't live in ancient Palestine. But in ancient Palestine, this sort of language would have resonated with Jesus' listeners. Wolves were the most common natural enemy of the sheep. Wolves would roam the hills and valleys looking for a sheep that had strayed away from the flock. At just the right moment, the wolf would strike and murder the helpless sheep. Now, false prophets are there mostly positive and pleasant. You can look at any televangelist and he's going to produce a very high-profile, high-energy, very me-centered message. Very pleasant, very positive. They will even use biblical terminology and often appear highly intelligent and knowledgeable about the Bible. The doctrines they affirm seemingly are biblical. But what are we to do? Now listen, I have a lot of cross-references in this sermon and I have a lot to get through, but I promise you I will do my best to get us out before the Methodists. So, but there is one particular cross-reference, and you don't have to turn to all these, but I think you'll want to turn to this one, and you may want to highlight it. So if you have your Bible, turn back to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, and we're just going to read one verse of Scripture there to tell us what we're supposed to do. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. John again, excuse me, gives us another imperative, another command. What does he say? Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. But why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is, the church is in its infancy here when John is speaking about this. Gnosticism has taken hold in the early church, and John is addressing this very thing in this verse. Now, I'm going to give you a real-world illustration, and ironically, Pastor John literally spoke about this just a few minutes ago when he was discussing our relationship. 
When I first visited here, I sat back there close to where Betty was. Sarah under my right arm, Bible in left hand, in my lap. I kept trying not to get distracted by how pretty Sarah was. But in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking, what's this guy going to preach about? Because I am very sound in my theology and I don't allow a lot of people to come in and infiltrate what I believe. And the whole time he's preaching, and I had heard things from other people churches in the area about this particular church and I was very hesitant to come here. And I even told my mom I was coming here. It's so, fu- it's so funny because I'm sitting there thinking, this is not how this church was portrayed at all when I, when, I, when I first heard about this. So my mom knew I was coming here. Then when I left, Sarah and I went to lunch and my mom, there was a text waiting on me from my mom. And she goes, well, how did it go? I said, you won't believe it. She goes, was it good? I'm like, it actually was. I said, the guy's no John MacArthur, but he was great. So if you don't know, John MacArthur is my hero. But I mean, it was completely biblically sound. And this is something that I really need to address. And I don't want you to take this personal, but I want you to understand something. This church has been so good and so supportive of my family. And I am, we are very blessed to have you. But if the word of God was not proclaimed in this pulpit like Pastor John does, we would not come here. Because as the spiritual leader of my home, it is up to me to lead my family. And I would not want to, I could not lead my family into a church that is not biblically sound. And I know even though Pastor John and I disagree on some minor things theologically, I know that my kids will be safe under his preaching. He exposits the scripture and he doesn't give me a TED talk about how great I am when I know deep down how terrible I am. But the problem that we have in this current generation is that we have a generation who is biblically ignorant. They would have no idea how to test the spirits as John commanded us to do back in 1 John chapter 4 because they have nothing to compare it to. Instead, we have what Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, where people are like children being tossed to and fro, banned away with every wind of doctrine. Satan has waited and has orchestrated this perfectly. What people fail to understand is Satan knows how the story ends. He's read the book. He knows that he is damned, and he's going to try to take everybody he can down with him. Satan has planted literally every sort of distraction known to man to keep people preoccupied, busy, entertained, and not concerned with the things of God. This generation is primed for the picking as a lamb to the slaughter because they simply do not know and they do not care enough to find out. But our Lord does not leave us blind. Back in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16, he specifically says, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? He specifically tells us, You will know them by their fruits. This brings me to my second point. They will show their true nature by their disobedience to Christ. Now, in verse 16, by their fruits is emphatic by its positioning at the beginning of the sentence. After warning about false prophets, Jesus tells us what to watch out for in identifying, and this is one of the tools you're going to need to practice discernment. Jesus assures us that we will know them by their fruits. Now, this brings me to where I, where I want to address and give you some information and some tools to use about discerning the He Gets Us campaign, then I will briefly address the Asbury Revival. Pastor John kind of threw me the ball on this one because he spoke about the He Gets Us movement a few weeks ago, and it sparked my interest because I had never heard of it, and then I did my own research. He Gets Us. If you visit their website, you will find a lot of hashtags. Of course, my generation, we called it a pound sign, but it's hashtag now. And you'll get a lot of uplifting material that at first glance to someone who isn't biblically sound would think, wow, this is great. They're talking about Jesus. They're being positive. This is wonderful. 
But I want to give you a quote by the marketing CEO, Jason Vanderground, and I quote, ultimately, the goal is inspiration, not recruitment or conversion. That is the CEO, Jason Vanderground, of the He Gets Us Move It, the marketing CEO. Ultimately, I'll read it again, and I quote, ultimately, the goal is inspiration, not recruitment or conversion. Now, if you go to their website and you use their search engine, do a search for the following words. Repentance, justification, hell, self-denial. Do you know how many results you will find? Zero. They're not there. Some of the main theological points of how man is reconciled with his God are completely absent from their website. But like Jesus said, by their fruits. Pastor John brought up bearing fruit a few weeks ago in our study of Philippians. But I want to address two of their hashtags. Hashtag number one, I just randomly picked these just because these were easier to refute and I have a lot to get through. And I would encourage you to do your own research on this. But the first one I want to, I think is relevant in the current climate that we live in. Hashtag refugee is one of their uh, hashtags on their website. Hashtag refugee. So hold your place here in Matthew chapter 7 and flip back just a few pages to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to pick it up at verse 12. Matthew chapter 2, verse 12. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. We'll go to verse 14. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. Now, if we look at this, it looks like they've got me, doesn't it? It looks like he fled from his own country and fled to another country. It looks like he got me, doesn't it? Not so fast. What he gets is fails to realize and fails to mention is that Egypt was conquered by Caesar Augustus around the year 31 B.C. at the Battle of Actium. Jesus was born between 6 and 4 B.C. This would mean that Egypt had became a part of the Roman Empire for around 25 years before Christ was ever born. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The same Caesar Augustus who in Luke chapter 2 ordered the census to take place, which brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, and through God's providence, allowing Caesar Augustus the victory at Actium, made the way of escape for Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus. Jesus fleeing to Egypt would be the equivalent of the people of California fleeing to Texas. He is not, was not, a refugee. False. Whatever happened to responsible research? Masters would have gave me a failing grade on something like that. But one more, just one more. Hashtag inclusive. This is a very popular talking point in today's political climate. Jesus is inclusive. But is he? Is he inclusive? Flip with me back to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And we're going to read Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 36. Now this is, Jesus is speaking here about his arrival, his first coming to earth. Verses 34 through 36. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I come to set man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. 
Jesus is speaking why he came the first time, and what does he say? He came to put people within their own households against each other. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very inclusive to me. But I got one more for you. Flip back with me to Matthew chapter 25. Because I didn't think it would be fair to not talk about his second coming. Matthew chapter 25. We're just going to read two verses of scripture here. Uh, We're going to read verses 31 and 32. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them from one another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Division not inclusion. Pastor John alluded to this over a week or so ago when we were discussing Philippians. The gospel in its truest understanding is divisive. It is not inclusive. In Luke 12, 51, our Lord specifically said, I came to bring division. Non-inclusion. What the He Gets This movement is attempting to do is turn Jesus into a social justice warrior. And I will say this one thing. The only time that the world will ever be just is when he comes back and judges it. Robbing your wealth and distributing it to somebody else who does not work is not social justice. Now, I don't have time to debunk all of their hashtags, but I would encourage you to do your own research. But the big hashtag they habitually bring up is the love of Jesus. I don't have all the time to dive into this, and I could preach a month of Sundays on the true love of Jesus. But I will say, the love that they are speaking of is not the love that Jesus is practicing in the Bible. The love that he gets us campaign is speaking of is cheap grace and the love and acceptance of one's sin. Their idea of love conquering all is holding on to the sins they do not wish to let go of. And the love of those sins, it took God's only son to pay for them. This is a seeker-sensitive movement that is turning the Jesus of the Bible into a palatable figure. If it isn't about conversion, it's about getting people comfortable with their sin that will ultimately lead to damnation. Just like our Lord said in verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. Fruit is, of course, a natural and common metaphor for righteous deeds. Author Wayne Grudem, who wrote a very interesting systematic theology, writes, and I quote, When we recall other metaphors in Scripture where good fruit is a sign of virtue, we already have an indication that the author is speaking about people who are not genuinely Christians. Just like he said here in Matthew. Now let's continue on back in Matthew chapter 7. We'll pick it up at verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. A fruit tree may be beautiful, it might be decorative, and offer pleasant shade in the summer. But its primary purpose is to bear fruit, and therefore it is judged by what it produces, not by how it looks. Now, back in verse 17... Even so, this is, this, is the key to the, this is the key to the pericope right here. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Makes sense, right? But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Now, when looking at the latter half of verse 17, we have our words of our Lord, and he specifically says, a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. The King James translates evil from the Greek word poniros. But the word has several meanings, such as, and these all 
in the, in the context of fruit and evil, all of these would apply. Uh, Paneros in the Greek means to be morally or socially worthless, wicked, evil, bad, base, worthless, vicious, degenerate. And this is where I want to address the Asbury Revival. First and foremost, the term revival is commonly used in, in the Baptist denomination. I can't remember another denomination that uses the term revival. Maybe they do. Where these traditions come, and they originate from a man named Charles Finney. In the 1800s, Finney started what we would understand as the altar call. That was real prevalent. The mourner's bench. And where he would, these were planned meetings. These were planned revival meetings. Um, he was a leader in the Second Great Awakening, if anyone remembers that from history class. We had to study that when I went to college, and we studied again in church history. Uh, but Finney believed you could engineer a conversion by playing off of emotion. Billy Graham, he adopted this sort of evangelism in, with his crusades. And this was mainstream Christianity when I was growing up. I can't think of anyone who doesn't remember watching uh, Billy Graham's altar calls where like thousands of people would migrate towards the front. But if you look at the Asbury Revival, it was all about the singing, the same songs over and over. Singing the same seven words 11 times can literally put you in a hypnotic state. It's true. It's proven. When doing my research, it appeared there was one 30-minute sermon throughout the revival. I was scanning the comments of some of the social media websites, and here's some of the comments I came across. We do not need any preaching here right now. Why do we need preaching? Preaching? Yet this contradicts what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 10, 14, when Paul specifically says, and I'll, I'll read you don't have to turn there, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Not singing the same seven words 11 times. And in verse 17 of the same chapter, Paul writes this, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, not singing. Habitually the same seven words 11 times. I can get an emotional reaction out of anybody by making them sing the same seven words 11 times. But what does the Bible tell us about conversion? Who decides? Can you literally engineer a state where you can literally engineer a conversion out of someone? Let's see what our Lord has to say about that. Turn with me to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 3 through 8. John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not what I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Now this is the key right here. In verse 8, The wind bloweth, where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. The key to this pericope is in verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes. We cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. Just like the wind, the Spirit goes where it will. It is not up to us. It is up to God to act upon the sinner's heart. God is sovereign. John 6, specifically says, No one comes to the Father lest I draw him. 
R.C. Sproul, I don't know if you know who R.C. Sproul is, he said one time, when was the last time you saw a person drawing water and hearing him say, here, water, water? Never. It is immediate. As an engineer, we have to manipulate the equipment to accomplish a task or to get a desired outcome. As an engineer, I'm going to tell you, you cannot engineer a true conversion out of someone. You cannot do it. What ends up happening is you manipulate someone emotionally and they think they have been converted when all actuality they were not. How do we know? Just like in verse 16, the Lord specifically says, by their fruit. They do not produce any fruit and there is, there is never any evidence of conversion. But they think they had an emotional experience, they prayed a prayer, they walked an aisle, that they're completely justified when they are not. That is the fatal attraction of false prophets. But some facts about the Asbury Revival. This was planned. It did not just spur up out of nowhere. Depending upon the source uh, you look at, they have had eight to ten of these revival meetings, all of them occurring in the month of February. Now, I want to read a tweet by a seminary student from Asbury. This individual's name, Elijah Drake. He is an open homosexual seminary student, and he tweets the following, and I quote, Day 8, and my seminary friends are still leading worship. Did you know people of color, women, and queer students have been leading the worship all eight days? End quote. There are other sources that have stated the same thing, but I thought if he was a seminary, this person was a seminary student, this would be the best quote or tweet to capture. This completely contradicts what Scripture teaches. The Apostle Paul specifically says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 that homosexuals will not enter the kingdom of God. But I have witnessed this firsthand when believers speak out on what's going on to other believers. They will attack you and call you cynical. When someone calls me cynical, I said, I prefer curmudgeon. <laughs> Proud of it. But what does Jesus actually say? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 18 specifically says, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. The Asbury Revival at the heart is a bad tree and therefore cannot produce good fruit. It completely contradicts what Scripture says. And not only that, I specifically chose these verses because everybody is hung up that the words in red mean more than the rest of the Bible when they don't. So I specifically chose the words of Jesus to address this. All of the Bible is inspired. All of it is the inerrant Word of God. The Bible is very clear. I want to, just real quick, I want to show you what real conversion looks like. Flip with me back to the book of Acts, chapter 2. Acts, chapter 2. I appreciate your patience, and I will, I've only got one point left, but I wanted you to see this. Acts, chapter 2, verses, we're going to read verses 22 through 24. Acts 2, 22. Ye, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth a man approved of God, among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourself also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsels and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified him and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed to the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden to it. Now, drop down to verse 37. This is the key. This is what true conversion looks like. Verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says unto them, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. That's conversion. Repent, believe the gospel. 
not sing a ridiculous song, cry about it. That's not conversion. My mom will get that way if she hears a song from the 70s. It's not conversion. And the key word is, the Lord God shall call, not man shall uh, manipulate. Completely different. The Lord God shall call. Lastly, false prophets and those who follow them will be punished. False prophets can be identified by their converts and followers. They will attract to themselves people who have the same superficial, self-centered, and unscriptural orientation as they do. 2 Peter 2.2 2 tells us, Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be malaligned. The Apostle Paul tells us again in 2 Timothy 4.3, they have been followers because they teach and promote what the majority of people want to hear and believe. Just like what's going on today. But what happens to these false prophets and those who follow them? Back in Matthew chapter 7, verses 19 and 20. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore... By the fruits ye shall know them. Now, notice the change in who Jesus is speaking about in verse 19. He goes from addressing the false prophets to every tree. Not just the false prophets, every tree that does not bring forth good fruit. Jesus goes from warning the false prophets to informing us that every tree that, bring, that does not bring forth good fruit is ekopto in the Greek, which literally means to be cut down, cut off, exterminated. They are cut down, but that's not the end. Notice the conjunction and in the sentence, and cast into the fire. Cast into the fire is a common metaphorical language for eschatological judgment. They will be judged and they will burn. The lack of righteousness will mean condemnation at the end. False prophets and their followers do not receive the love of truth so as to be saved. And for this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so they might believe what is false in order that all may be judged who do not believe the truth but took pleasure in the wickedness. As our Lord's sermon draws to, to its conclusion, we are presented with a stern warning. Some people pretend to be and appear something they really are not. These false prophets, as they are here called, can undermine the true flock if they are, not follow, if they are followed. The ultimate test of truth is in what these people do, not what they say. For what they do inescapably betrays their character and points to the judgment that awaits them. This passage points very vividly to the absolute importance of true righteousness. The ultimate test of the truth is in deeds, not claims or pretensions. Now, the church must be ever vigilant against appearances and empty words impress the criterion of good works and discerning the true from the false. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for the stern warning that you give us in the pages of this book, Lord. Thank you for providing the tools that we need to practice discernment. And thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die in our place. We ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Thank you, Larry. Well, a fundamental truth that um, he brings out and important to us, and that is one of the false propositions given to us by our world is judge not lest ye be judged. And that's one side of the coin the other side of the coin is, he that's spiritual judges all things. 
judge not lest you be judged is picking the character of an individual and making a judgment upon them. Being spiritual and judging all things means that you use a standard. It's called the Word of God. And it either fits or it doesn't with the standard. What makes us unique as Christians is that we believe the Bible is God's standard. And so even though we might get emotionally involved in something, we have to set our emotions aside and we have to look at the Word of God and say, is it say yay or nay? And many of us who have family and people that believe differently and ha have a different standard for how they live their life will always provide this uneasiness and sometimes even hostility. And if we're not careful for the sake of relationship, we will give truth the back seat rather than giving it its rightful position, and that's the front seat. The Bible is real clear about yeas or yeas and nays or nays, and they're never the opposite. And as we align ourselves as Bible believing Christians, we say, on God's word we stand. Or we all fail. If God's word is not true, then we're still in our sin and there's no hope. But if God's word is true, it becomes the standard by which we evaluate everything. And God commends us. He that's spiritual judgeth all things. And in today's world, there's so many things, as Larry brought out, that on the outward Appearance, they may look attractive and exciting and spiritual. But when we look down into them and we compare God's Word with what they do, we find out they are not at all what they appear to be on the outside. One of the joys of a good, strong local church is that not everybody can discern that. And you come together like we are today and we're given biblical uh, advice on how to evaluate and discern these things. Thank you, Larry, for bringing the truth to us. And what a great passage of Scripture. Beware. Um, you know why we say all the time, you know why it says beware? Because most people are not. And so he says, this is something that people fall for easily, so beware. Let's stand. Take our hymnal... Let's sing this great invitation song, 185, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Stand in the truth. Make no apology for the truth. Don't be a bull in a china closet. But never, ever be ashamed of the truth. Larry and his family are standing by the back door. If you usually exit out the paratrooper's door, make sure you swing by. Amen. And uh, say thank you for preaching today and encourage them in the Lord. Make sure you let their family know that you appreciate them coming too. Their church family is saying, where are they today? Okay, God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. Thanks.